Welcome to the Queen Trail Podcast. There are three different types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. What does this technology do? It's like, well, what can you do with electricity? I just survived 30 years HIV positive. I'm certainly not going to let a little thing like a brain tumor derail me. When I got the 29 pounds, I was so tired, I just collapsed. Everything always goes back to being grounded and centered. It's a mecca for cycling, for sure. The struggle is the neutralizing force. And I said, there it is. This is the right family. I'm, I got like cold chills. And- it's one lone oak tree right in the middle of the trail. It's beautiful. Hey everybody, I hope you had a great week since the last time that we got together. I am super excited to share this week's Feel the Company of Friends talk with you. It is with my amazing friend, Brooke Applegate. She is the Director of Education at the Los Angeles Arboretum. She holds a degree in anthropology and she's worked at a number of some of my very favorite museums, including the La Brea Tar Pits, Kids Space Museum, and at such places doing great things for the planet, like tree people. She's taught English to non-native speakers, and she is a world traveler. So you're going to hear a bunch of adventures following up shortly, as well as a lot of what she's done in the museums. And we're going to cover a lot. So it's a very interesting talk. She is a professional whimsy maker, a seeker of joyful things, as well as a community builder. And she is one of my dearest friends, so fascinating to share a cup of coffee with her. So please grab a cuppa and join me in this In the Company of Friends talk with my friend, Brooke Applegate. You recently returned from a trip to Costa Rica. Prior to COVID, there was Mexico City, Vietnam, Paris, just to name a few. You seek to learn more about the culture and connect with people. And I guess that comes back to your anthropology background. Um, But what's made the most lasting impression on you anywhere that you've traveled? Hmm. (laughs) Again, that's hard. Um, I think probably... The first thing that comes to mind is when I was in Vietnam, I um, broke off by myself and went to the north to the Sapa Mountains that border China and their Hmong villages in these really, really steep mountains. And they have a lot of rice paddies on the mountains and indigo farms. And you can't go hike through those villages on your own. You have to go with a guide. So I booked a guide through something called Sapa Sisters. It was the only Hmong-owned, women-owned trekking company in the Sapa Mountains because wow. most of them are owned by um, Vietnamese business people or some Chinese. But the Hmong in that region are kind of considered second-class citizens. So they're still living in tribal societies and... The Vietnamese population are the ones in the city, and so the Vietnamese population, they're the ones that can create the businesses to take tourists through these mountains. So the Sapa Sisters, it's Hmong-owned, but also all of their guides are women, the owners are women, and it's intended to give Hmong women an opportunity to make their own living so that they don't have to rely on their husbands. Because my understanding is that they're still expected to be wives and mothers. And so I was paired up with a guide. She was very charming. I don't remember her name at the moment. Um, But she was a very progressive young woman. And as she was walking me through all of these steep mountains, we'd be walking for a while and then we'd come across other tourists that were there with guides from her tribe and then we'd be walking for a while and then we'd come across other tourists that were there from guides from other tribes and so every time we would pass by somebody she would explain how to tell who was from one tribe and who was from another because I couldn't tell the difference. They were all in very colorful traditional outfits that were not for tourist benefits. That's how they dress. Um, And so she would tell us, yes, in my tribe this is our color scheme, right? In their tribe the women wear pants. In this tribe, you know, And she would talk about how she was considered a real problem in her community 
because she didn't want to get married and she didn't want to have a child. She wanted to go to school. She wanted to have her own life and it was a disgrace. And then she just casually goes into how her husband kidnapped her. Not that she was bride Oh my God. But how she was bride napped. And I was like, wait, wait, let's, let's back up as we're just like, Walking through the Hmong Mountains, being followed by pigs and wild animals in a rainstorm covered in mud, right? Oh, and my she's goodness. just like, yeah, I mean, that's just a lot of the time, that's how it happens here. You're just like, you're kidnapped and then you become someone's bride. And I'm like, I've read about this. I, I learned about this in school, but this is still happening. And she was like, yeah. So she told me how it happened to her. And it was somebody from a neighboring tribe. But it was... Educational and humbling for me because I was horrified. But she was just like, Brooke, that's just... That's, that's just... how people get married here. Like, you just... And she was like, it's not like I was locked up and tortured or anything like that. Like, they wanted me. Like, the family wanted me. His parents wanted me, you know? And I was like, did your family, like, send out a search party? And she's like, what are you talking about? They were happy that this happened. And so that just, like... I wasn't reading about this in a book, you know, I was living it as I was walking through mud and it was just, it was intense, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I think, I think she ended up putting up enough of a fight that it didn't happen. Or maybe that, that guy was from her tribe and she ended up marrying a man that she wanted to for love from a different tribe and having a baby with him. It was like, again, I had stepped through a portal to this other world and just having my bias challenged according to my Western perspective of what's right and wrong, right? Right. That was incredible. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to travel yeah, to get a perspective of the world that is not Westernized. Um, we're like, oh my God, that's so terrible. I mean, like you heard me gasp when you said that she was bride napped holy cow right what a horrible thing for us to have something like that happen to us or happen to somebody that we really love Mm -hmm. um but that is cultural over there that's not something to be horrified by by so part of this two-day adventure was you would do homestays right so midday we would stop into somebody's home that knew we were coming they prepared a meal for us and other travelers So there was a guide from her tribe that showed up with two other travelers, one woman from New York and one from Boston, all of us about the same age. And so I brought up this concept and they were like, yeah, we've been wondering about that too. So then their guide started talking about it and she was like, oh yeah. And she just like joyfully tells the story about when she was kidnapped by her husband. (laughs) And we're like, what the hell? But she wasn't... A rebel about it. She was like, yeah, I had always thought he was kind of cute. So I was kind of excited when he did it. And we're just like, son of a bitch. Like, this is, oh my this is unreal. But she was just giggling about it. You know? Customs. Customs are so different in so many different places. So that's, I mean, I don't know that that's my most memorable, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. And you just came back from Costa Rica. I know you did like some really fun stuff over there. You went to a chocolate farm. Mm -hmm. and got to roast it, grind it, Mm -hmm. turn it into something drinkable. Mm -hmm. How was that? In seven degree weather over an open fire. (laughs) Uh, It almost killed me, but I was determined. (laughs) That's crazy because we went to Costa Rica shortly before you. Mm -hmm. And we got there just out at the same time as a tropical storm Mm -hmm. came through from the Caribbean Mm -hmm. and it dumped water on us every single day. And it just, you know, you just woke up in the morning and it was like, all right, well, if I want to see anything, I got to be wet. And if I'm not willing to be wet today, then I'm just going to be staying indoors. So we just went out. So, so much. Right. They're just walking no, around in the rain. We were we all just walked around yeah. in the rain. We all got wet. Um, Sophie and I did have raincoats and you know plastic raincoats with hoodies, but yeah, there weren't any umbrellas, and it was wonderful. I mean, it was just one of the adventures of our lifetime. Yeah. I mean, every single time that I tell somebody about what I do on vacation, 
almost invariably they go, I'm never going on vacation. Same. With you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Right? Because we're such adventurers. But, um, you know, we're here to live. And I feel like that's what you have to do, yeah. you know? And where else are you going to get stories like that? You're not going to get it in the middle of the city. Mm-hmm. You know, that's amazing. I remember when I lived in Redondo Beach. We had some neighbors that moved in across the street from us, and they were Indian. And so they had people coming in with incense and bells and dressed in their saris and very nice, nice suits that the men were wearing. It was just beautiful, very colorful. And eventually we got to know them, and their marriage was arranged. And I'm just like... I could not imagine. And they have one of the strongest marriages. And uh, it was Preet and Tage is the couple's name. And they would tell us the funniest stories of getting to know each other because Tage grew up like on a cattle farm in Ohio. And she, I believe, I might be completely wrong, but I believe that she lived in India until she got married. And then it was just kind of like, you know, she was like, I don't know if I like this guy. And Um, Just the awkwardness, all of that awkwardness, Mm -hmm. you know, but they knew that this was like their destiny. This is what they did Mm -hmm. in their culture. And um, (coughs) it's just blossomed into just, a you know, a really wonderful relationship for them. Mm -hmm. But it's so different from anything that we would be okay with, Mm -hmm. you know. And yet not that far removed, my grandmother's marriage was arranged by maternal grandmothers. Wow. Mm -hmm. She was 17 and he was older than her. This was in Rochester, New York, but they were all Italian immigrants. So it was like an Italian village. It was like being in Italy. She was scared. She was sad. But he died when she was 29, and she mourned him till the day she died at 88 years Wow. Old. Did she remarry? She did. Yeah. Yeah, in her 50s. What an amazing life. Uh-huh. So interesting, right? Uh-huh. So she ended up falling in love with him after all. I mean, I, or just loving him. I don't know. We didn't have those conversations. Yeah. You know, she died when I was 23, but um, when we were just starting to have those conversations. So she either fell in love with him or just grew to love him because he was her husband and the father of her children. He was a good man, you know? Yeah. So. Wow. Um, just going back to the chocolate. <laughs> I know... <laughs> Chocolate is so good. Um, I know you've been to like all of these countries and you're also vegetarian. Has it been difficult to find vegetarian food when you go abroad or has it been harder to find vegetarian food here in the States? Abroad. I mean, I, I aim for vegan, but I call myself vegish because particularly while I travel, finding vegan unless you want to eat a bowl of rice everywhere you go it's pretty difficult Mm -hmm. so um it's more difficult than i'd like it to be traveling but i can be adoptable i'll I'll eat dairy and eggs if i'm traveling um it's easier in latin american countries yeah beans beans and rice rice, (laughs) corn yeah i think there's a lot of vegetables yeah, I don't think I've found that as much in Costa Rica. Like, they don't really serve vegetables as a side like we do. It's mm-hmm. not like, you know, dig in. Mm-hmm. You know, um, this morning, I have a, this prolifically producing Japanese eggplant. I, I just told Sophie, we got to pick all those eggplants again. We just had a, a harvest a couple of weeks ago. And um, we love just to make pulled pork in quotation, Mm -hmm. pulled eggplant sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And they taste so much like that. And um, I love the innovation of vegetarian food, the innovation that you find here, especially in California. But across the United States, really, like we've kind of embraced vegetarianism and veganism. And it surprises me when I travel outside of the United States that vegetables are not as big a part of meals as you would expect them to be Mm -hmm. in countries where like anything can grow in the soil here Mm -hmm. in Costa Rica. When we were there, Sophie does eat fish. She's vegetarian, um, but she does eat fish. So we had a lot of ceviche while we were there. Mm -hmm. 
It was Costa Rica great. was easy because their traditional dish, gallo pinto. Gallo pinto. It's it's like rice a vegetarian's dream. It's vegan. Yeah. It was just rice and beans. A couple of places there were there was egg in it, but um, just rice and beans and tomatoes and lettuce and onions and lots. By day of... five, I'd had my fill. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was divine. It was such a relief when I first got there. I make gallo pinto, but everybody tells me it's not gallo pinto. When my, when I was a kid, my grandma would make it, of course, like Costa Rica, because you know she grew up there before she moved here. Um, but I throw everything but the kitchen sink in it, so it's more like a succotash, I guess. Or but evidently that is the traditional way of like a lot of leftovers. Go yeah, into it. all the leftovers go yeah. in there. That's kind of what I remember. But you know, I I love it. When I went to Costa Rica. It was different than what I make, Mm -hmm. you know, and like you said, after like the fifth day, I was like, all right, let's try something else. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So um, what's the most surprising thing that you've tasted somewhere vegan wise that you've liked? Traveling wise? Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't. I haven't been adventuresome eating, traveling. It's been difficult to find vegan vegetarian food and it's not like it's been particularly exciting when i have it's been rice and beans rice and beans or noodles when you were in vietnam the oh my god the vegan pho in vietnam was to die for yeah again in the sapa mountains it was our last couple hours so we were hiking straight up for several hours in the rain out of the canyon there was just a little shack where we stopped at for lunch and I I'd struggled so much to find vegetarian food in Vietnam that I was like I'm screwed like there's no way the shack is going to be able to accommodate me and they just gave me pho with tofu and fresh chilies from like behind the shack Mm. and it was freezing and we'd been hiking like 15 miles a day and it was just absolutely amazing. Hit the spot. Yeah. Yeah. It was incredible. Food tastes so much better when you've been hiking a long ways and you're up in the mountains, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. The place that we had stopped into uh, for that lunch the day before where we intersected with other travelers and they told us about the bride napping. We found ourselves in this home and there were like eight of us that were just women about the same age. And um, we could tell that the owner of the house and our two guides... Because we got so familiar so quickly. And that doesn't always happen with tour guides. So I could tell that they were feeling very comfortable. So it was almost time for us to leave. So this is probably the most memorable thing that I ate. <laughs> <laughs> the, the owner of the house comes in holding a bowl. And she plops it down on the table. And it's just this like off yellow liquid. And then she gives us each these tiny little like bowl cups. And she tells us to scoop it in. So we do, and then she cheers us and says something in her language, and then we knock it back, and it's liquor. It's rice wine. What? That they brew. Oh, my gosh. Was it enough to get drunk off? Oh. I bet it was really strong. So we we were like, what is this? And they all laughed, and they said, happy juice. And (laughs) so we all start laughing. It was strong. But, like, so we'd, you know, drink some, and then they, there was some custom in terms of, like, using this hand or putting it this place on the table. We were very much feeling it. But every time we were about to be done, they'd tell us to get another one because they're used to it, right? And she lives there. Anyway, I think we had about eight little shots of happy juice <laughs> or happy water. So we were definitely... It was a short hike to where we were staying that night, thankfully. Oh, my but God. But that was incredible. Because I don't think they pulled that out for all their tourists. It was not included in our package. That's sure. amazing. That's super cool. Yeah. And as it turned out, I found out later that day that it was uh, International Women's Day, which none of us were thinking about. I that. remember you posted about yeah. that. Because it's a much bigger deal in other countries than it is in America. So we're all at our homestays that night, and all of our guides ask us if we're settled, if we're good, and they're like, okay, we're going to go. And then we just see all these women walking through the village holding, like, bouquets of flowers and holding hands with other women. And then we just hear, like, these crazy parties down the road. And I asked the owner of the homestay, like, what's going on? And they were like, well, it's International Women's Day. And we were like, yeah, but it's a big deal. Yeah, those were some really beautiful, striking photos, especially... 
because of the colorful outfits yeah. and the flowers and the mountains, yeah. the setting. What a great day to be traveling. Yeah, that was good timing. Um, speaking of travel, you know, you don't always have to leave the country to go traveling. And I know that you do your urban tours. So you've done tours through Little Tokyo, Alvera Street, Hollywood, Koreatown, just to name a few. How do you prepare for these? I mean, like, tell me about the tours. What could people expect? Well, the companies that I've worked for, I worked for Urban Adventures before, but it, that dissolved during COVID. So now I work for a company called We Venture. Um, but very similar ethos. So the companies have, I don't want to say scripts, but they have, you know, database of historic information on all of these places. So you study it, you learn about it, then honestly, any really good tour guide does their own research too and finds what they connect to about it. And I think most good tour guides, it's not about being scholarly about it. It's about being excited about it and then it just feels like you're walking new friends through your city showing them around you know so that's the mindset that I always go into it with and I started doing it while well, city walking tours nine years ago because I needed a part-time job so I found this and um, it seemed like a fun way to supplement my income and I just absolutely fell in love with it and I know I'm paid well by my employer now, so I no longer have to. Although, let's face it, it's Los Angeles. It always helps to have a second income. Right. But I don't have to do it to make ends meet now. But I do it because I love it. I really, really enjoy it. And we get a combination of tourists and locals alike. And with tourists, it's meaningful because you get to really show them the authentic Los Angeles, right? Something that they're not going to see if they try to go about it on their own. I was listening to some show recently where an anthropologist referred to L.A. as an above-ground archaeological dig. And what she meant was, you have to dig, you have to search to find the gems, but they're there. And it's true, it's not like uh, New York or Chicago or San Francisco where you step off the plane and there's the Statue of Liberty, you know? And a lot of people hate that about LA. I used to hate it about LA, but now I see it as a really exciting challenge. But I like that I can take that like work out of it for tourists that only have a weekend, because um, otherwise they'd leave not seeing a lot of these things and they'd be disappointed by my city. But locals, getting to show locals your city, that's, that's the gold, right? Yes. It's amazing. I I agree. Well, you know, I I love going to downtown Los Angeles. It's one of my favorite places. It's where all the culture is, all the restaurants. It's so much to see. The museums are there. But it's not just downtown Los Angeles. It's enclaves and outside of downtown Los Angeles Mm -hmm. as well, where you find some serious gems. And, you know, L.A. is so sprawling and huge that almost every day, you could go out, you could leave your home and find something new that's different, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think downtown Los Angeles has probably one of the worst reputations Mm -hmm. with locals Mm -hmm. is what I really find. And I'll come back just reinvigorated, re-energized from a trip to downtown Me LA too. to look at, you know, the old architecture, to go eat at a new eatery down there, to go see the skyline from a different rooftop, yeah. you know, performance arts, all of that. Yeah. And people kind of turn off. I just watch them turn off. Yeah. And there was one day where I was starting to go into my story about downtown Los Angeles with a friend. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's just drive-by country, isn't it? And I'm like, whoa, hold on. Do you know how magical that place is, you know? The first movie theaters in America, the talkies, you know? Broadway. The history that is there is just really amazing. You know, the Biddy Mason Memorial. Which nobody knows about. Right. And it's right there. Even people that go to Grand Central Market and know about all of that, they don't know what's across the street. Yeah. You know? They don't know what's up in the financial district, yeah. which is a lot of those plazas have sculpture gardens, mm-hmm. beautiful fountains, and they were designed by notables in architecture and in art. People don't know about Lillian Disney's secret garden. I don't. See? 
And I don't. Yeah, but that is so exciting. There you go. After five years in DC, I felt like I, I, I'm sure there was more to see, but I felt like I'd seen almost all of it. Mm-hmm. I never feel that way in LA. Yeah, it's it's a magical place. So many different places to, to see, I, and you can get up in the morning with a beach sunrise. Uh-huh. And be up in the mountains by afternoon and in the evening head out to the desert. Mm-hmm. And we just have such diverse biomes. Yeah. And they're nearby enough that you can go to all of these within a day that, yeah. yeah. I think taking people on tours of Hollywood is probably my favorite. I prefer downtown to Hollywood, but leading tours of Hollywood may be my favorite because it's the most surprising to people Mm -hmm. because locals and tourists alike get to Hollywood and they're like oh my god it's just loud and it's full of hustlers and neon and there's a gap and but old Hollywood is still intact and like if you just have someone that can help you step beyond the veil you you can touch Marilyn Monroe's ghost at the Roosevelt. You know what I mean? Or, like, most people don't even know that the Hollywood Museum is right there at the intersection of Hollywood and Highland. It's got four floors of over 100 years' worth of Hollywood memorabilia. Marilyn Monroe became a blonde there. Um, Lucille Ball became a redhead there. And their dressing rooms, their hair and makeup rooms are still intact. You know? That's... Amazing. But nobody, nobody knows about that place, yeah. and it's like fifteen. And then right next door, right, well, right nearby anyway, over at Grauman's, you can see Marilyn Monroe's handprints mm-hmm. and that really nice mm-hmm. quote of hers about anybody could be anything, mm-hmm. something like and that. I don't remember what her quote is. Where like the Roosevelt's amazing. And there's so much history there. The first ever Academy Awards were held there, you know, in a fifteen minute ceremony. But if you're just walking on Hollywood Boulevard and like getting distracted by the Superman that wants to take a picture with you, like you're gonna pass by it. I mean, it is a beautiful building on the outside, but not strikingly so immediately. But if you just open the door, you're suddenly in this incredible wonderland, Mm -hmm. you know? So I love that. I love being able to pull back the veil for people in Hollywood. Yeah, and then just the history of the Egyptian. The Egyptian's such a cool place mm-hmm. because they actually have, at least the last time that I went, just before COVID hit, they still had thirteen dollar movies, mm-hmm. and they would have a historian mm-hmm. telling you about how this movie was created, who the people were. They have events. There was um, the seventy fifth anniversary of Cleopatra, and they showed it at. The Egyptian, which has the most phenomenal theater. It's a scarab beetle. Mm -hmm. And it's just, and it's Art Deco. That movie theater was actually built for the premiere of Cleopatra, but it wasn't finished in time. So Cleopatra premiered at Mm Grauman's, which sadly is now like... The TCL... But TCL stands for the creative life, which is kind of fun. But I just, <laughs> I wish that they would leave the names, you know. I think everyone still refers to it as Grauman's. As Grauman's. I do. Yeah. So, I do too. I do. But you're right. There is, there's so much history there and you just have to look for it. And then off of Hollywood Boulevard, there's a lot of other play- Hollywood high schools over there. Mm-hmm. There's so many places along Melrose. But, I mean, you just get into so many of the little enclaves. Yeah, I do like Lar- Larchmont. Um, then you have Hollywood Forever Cemetery right mm-hmm. there, which is really awesome. And even, like, the non-historic stuff. Like, there's a lot of, like, frat house type of places along Hollywood Boulevard. But, again, there's Michelli's, the oldest Italian restaurant with, like, the singing wait staff, right? Yeah. And all the bottles hanging from the ceiling. Yeah. And you would never think to step inside of there unless you were with somebody that knew. Or Bordner's. Or even, again, places that aren't historic, but, like, all the speakeasies tucked in there, right? So there's Good Times at Davy Wayne's, where you enter through an Airstream refrigerator, and then you're in a 1970s shag carpet living room while somebody's playing the Bee Gees on a turntable. Like, it's fun. Yeah. And those are things that you would never find unless you're actually looking Mm -hmm. for them, you know. Do you have a, um, well, you just said Hollywood is probably your favorite tour. 
It, it's not my favorite tour. It's just my favorite thing to reveal to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the the old company that I, that I worked with, we did an ethnic neighborhoods food and culture tour, and we went, took people through Koreatown, Thai Town, and Little Armenia on foot to prove to people that, yes, we do walk and take the bus in L.A., and we would just pop into little hole-in-the-wall places and let people try samples of foods from those different cultures. Um, and then, of course, talk about the history of immigration to Los Angeles from those countries. Yes. And just, again, tourists and locals alike. It, we weren't walking through glamorous neighborhoods, you know, but we were showing them the real L.A. And, yeah, it's not glamorous, but look how beautiful it still is, mm -hmm. you know, through food and through cultural exchange. So. Yeah. I think that was my favorite to date, for sure. I know you did one on Alvera Street, and there was, like, taco tasting mm -hmm. and tequila or something like that. Taco and film locations. So you're standing in line for um, a carnitas taco, and across the street is the Bradbury Building, and you're yeah. talking about that filming location and all of that. They've turned that into a bar. Oh, I know. I heard about that. Yeah. But it hasn't been open that I've gone. I, yeah, I haven't been over that way in a little bit, so maybe we can go together and check it out. I think that would be really cool. And get some tacos. And get some tacos. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they have such amazing food. Um, when you were talking about those neighborhoods, you know, I had read a book with Sophie by Lisa C. called, um, I believe it's called Beautiful Girls. And I might have the name wrong, but I will post the correct name. I'll update it in the show notes. Um, and it's historical fiction. Lisa C. is of Chinese descent. And her family owned a store for ages in L.A.'s Chinatown. And so when she writes her books, it's got a lot of this history in there. And she talked about the Lee family in this book. She very accurately described Chinatown and the meaning of all of these different plazas there and how it connected at one time because it was really a movie set. Um, Chinatown and this little Mexican movie set, which has become Alvera Street, mm -hmm were connected to each other. And then there was a fire that kind of separated them. Now there's all these buildings in between. But I've done this out on foot too. We actually did a walking tour, self guided walking tour, you can find them online, and went through several places in Chinatown. And, and after we finished reading that book, we were looking for all of the Lee places, because the Lee family owned so many places. And, and you find them, I don't know that the Lee family was the real family, like how much of it is fiction and how much of it is not. But that was a lot of fun. And we ended up eating in a restaurant that was used in the rush hour film. And then we walked right down to Alvera Street and the Chinese American Museum is actually behind Alvera Street. And then of course, Union Plaza is right across the and you just, you know, Walking through Los Angeles is completely doable and a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you see so much. Mm -hmm. We walked under the Welcome Dragons. Uh -huh. So it was, you know, it was pretty cool. There's so much. And we don't see it because we're driving. Mm -hmm. And we're stuck in traffic. Right. So. Right. I always encourage people to take walking tours of their cities. Because they'll just see things that they never knew were there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I agree. Let's cover some of the things that you're doing over at the Arboretum and ways that people can get connected with the Arboretum if they're here in Los Angeles. We have a few different programs. Well, we have loads of different programs. We have wellness programs for adults. We have art programs for adults. We have horticulture programs for adults. Um, our children's programs, we have the summer camp programs. We have Nature Club, which is an after-school program and a Saturday morning program that's a shorter version of our summer camp program. And the main focus, I guess that's important to note, the main focus of our children's programs, we want to spark joy. We want to get them outdoors and connecting with nature. But more than anything, we're using nature programming as an opportunity to foster empathy at a young age. Um, and I think nature and joy in nature is one of the best ways that you can do that. So like we have a colony of hissing cockroaches that we keep in our classroom 
And as adults, we hear that and we're completely creeped out. First of all, cockroaches, period. But a colony of hissing cockroaches from Madagascar, right? But most of these kids don't know yet that they're supposed to be afraid of those things or that they're supposed to think they're gross. Or if they do, they're still plastic enough that if we ask them, well, why? They don't know what to say, right? Or they'll say, oh, well, it's gross because it's ugly. And then we'll say, well, what's ugly about it? And tell me an insect that you think is pretty. Well, a butterfly is pretty. Well, why is a cockroach ugly? Well, because it's dark and it's it's got that scaly shell. Well, let's, let's really look at the body of a butterfly, right? Like, so then you put them side by side and they're really not all that different. And, you know, butterflies are wonderful. They're pollinators, etc. But... Cockroaches are decomposers. Worms are decomposers. We're creeped out by worms, but we wouldn't have food to eat if it wasn't for worms, right? So nature provides you with the opportunity to teach children empathy for the other. And it may sound like a Pollyanna stretch, but if you can get a kid to stop and check their bias about a cockroach, that that has a far-reaching effect, Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. That makes complete sense. This person what is, is similar to? to me, right? Mm-hmm. Like this person looks different from me. This person is a different color from me. Or this person has a face that I don't like for whatever reason. But does that mean that they're inherently bad? And that's a natural reaction. You know, I remember, sadly, there was a man when I think Cameron was about three years old, and he got out of his car right next to us while we were standing there and he'd been through clearly um, some horrific accident Mm -hmm. that really really impacted his face Mm -hmm. and Cameron looked up at him and immediately hid behind me and so of course I had the conversation that it was okay you know and and just kind of taught him empathy that way but I think it's good to start early and to start with things that are different than Mm -hmm. just humans because that's going to extrapolate not just to humans but it's also going to extrapolate to ideas and concepts and perspectives Mm -hmm. that others bring into the world and i think that's so important yeah um i had a couple of things with what you were saying that i wanted to bring up you had to bring home (laughs) the hissing cockroaches, and you did not like them very much. And two tarantulas. (laughs) And two tarantulas. And two tarantulas. (laughs) But we all, you know, sheltered in place together. Yeah, that was... uh, Bonded us. (laughs) That was your your COVID um, taking one for the team. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't stay there. Somebody had to take care of them. So Brooke brought them home. And we got to follow her journey (laughs) on Facebook and going from uh, not being very happy to have them to actually being quite fascinated by them. Well, they were, they were my bunker buddies, (laughs) you know, so they were uncomfortable being in my apartment. I was too, you know, but we got through it together. (laughs) How long do the cockroaches live for? I have no idea. No. <laughs> I should know. But they made it through COVID. Oh, yeah. And back. They've, they've had, I think, three generations of, maybe four generations of babies since then. And they produce about 40 viable young every time. Wow. So. And I know that Madagascar hissing cockroaches are quite different than the cockroaches that people are afraid of in their homes. Mm-hmm. But they're no better and no worse, right? Mm -hmm. Like, on one hand, they're less terrifying to people because they're slower moving, so they're not going to scurry the same way. At the same time, they're enormous, you know? They are huge. And I, I can't really speak to house cockroaches either, but the environments that house cockroaches are attracted to, I think if they could be out on a forest floor eating decomposing lemons, they'd much rather be there mm-hmm. than in your kitchen, mm-hmm. right? So if they are in our gross, smelly trash, like we have a hand in that, right? We're contributing to those environments. Yeah. So, but I don't know 
all that much about cockroaches, actually. I just know that the Madagascar ones make wonderful pets and they're going to outlive us all. So. And do they hiss? Mine don't as much anymore because they're, <laughs> they're very socialized. But yeah, and it's just a phenomenal adaptation. They live in colonies. So if you're a predatory bird flying over the forest floor in the mood for a snack, and as you approach, you just hear this, the, the hiss of hundreds of cockroaches, you're going to think twice before you swoop down because you're going to assume that it's something that could hurt you. How fascinating is that? That is. Yeah. And also something that's really good for kids because children feel vulnerable, right? So teaching them that something as small and defenseless as a cockroach can be clever. And if they band together, you know, socially, they can protect one another. Mm-hmm. Just so many good teachable moments with that kind of stuff. That's amazing. Yeah. Insects fascinate me because they have so many adaptations that you wouldn't ever think of. And, you know, just so many of them go through these crazy metamorphic stages where, you know, just even a ladybug, ladybug nymphs or larvae, they're the ones that eat, but they're the hungriest little aphid eaters. And they look like elongated, non-rolling roly-polies. They just have like all of these striations Mm -hmm. and they're black with a little bit of red on them. Mm -hmm. Look nothing like a ladybug. Uh But that's another thing that we use in our programming because I've never met a child that was afraid of a ladybug. Why? Because we've told them they don't have to be. Right. Right? They're red. They're cute. But they will they have freak polka out dots. if they see their, their larva because they look like tiny alligators. So when I tell them, that's just a teenage ladybug, that's a very powerful moment, you know? And so we'll ask them, like, well, why are you not afraid of a ladybug? but you're afraid of a black beetle. Not all ladybugs are red. They come in different colors, including black. But if it landed on you and it was a black beetle, you'd be freaking out. Why? Like, let's talk about that, you know? And children are smart. They're smart enough to be like, oh, yeah, interesting. And then thankfully in my work, I'm not just with them for a day. So being with them for several weeks at a time, I get to see those perspectives cemented and I get to see their worldview and their behaviors change according to that kind of stuff, you know? And it, it, it may sound insignificant, but I genuinely believe that planting those seeds, I, I, I think it goes a long way in terms of the types of adults they become. on. I think so too. I did an episode um, when I was a kid my grandma would punish me. I'm not going to speak for my sister. She was much younger than I was, but she would definitely punish me. I remember being in preschool and she put a bunch of fire ants in a, in a baggie, sealed it up, and stuck the whole bag in my pants. Are you- yes, I'm not kidding. What? I'm not kidding. Um, and I do remember sitting there shaking uncontrollably because I was so frightened that these ants were going to get loose and bite me. And I didn't get bitten, but that created a mental connection with how dangerous bugs could be. And I spent a lifetime, I mean, half of my life, I wouldn't say a lifetime, but really until my early to mid 20s, being terrified. I had a horrible phobia of bugs, horrible. Rightly so. It was, it was the worst thing ever. I was afraid of flies. A crane fly just came up from the floorboards of a moving car and I opened the door and almost jumped out into traffic. Mm-hmm. Crane flies are completely harmless. Yeah. And I almost jumped out when a wasp flew into my car and it must have been like a paper wasp. I don't know for sure, but it had a green ball in its front legs. And so I imagine it was going to go plaster that somewhere. And there was so much traffic on that street that the car generated wind blew that wasp into my car. And it was just sitting there holding on to this green ball of uh, vegetation that had chewed up (laughs) 
looking a little dazed yeah. and just kind of trying to catch its breath. But all I saw was danger. It yeah. was going to, and I almost pushed my, my cousin was in the car with me. I almost pushed her into traffic so that I could get out on her side. And she told me I was completely insane. She was just like, absolutely not. I'm not going out into traffic, you know, because she was thinking straight. Somehow I got the wasp out of the car. Um, but I had those incidents and eventually I had a super embarrassing, I just like embarrassed the hell out of one of my girlfriends, Suzette. And I was just like screaming around like, you know, some mad butcher was behind me with a, with a knife ready to kill me. And it was all because this California carpenter bee had flown into the bathroom that I was in, which was all metal. So, you know, it's in there, <laughs> it's like drone multiplying, you know, and I'm just like thinking, there's going to be a story in the paper in the morning, woman dies, stunk to death by a million bees <laughs> on the toilet, you know, right. <laughs> and when I finally calmed down, she, I don't remember what the talk she had with me was exactly, but I do remember she was very quiet, very zen-like, but I think she was very stressed and she's like, if you do not get a handle on this, you're going to have children. Yeah. And your children are going to be petrified of bugs. And something about that conversation hit me. When I left work, I stopped at the bookstore, got a bunch of books on bugs and insects, and just sat down and opened up this world of what I never knew that I didn't know dragonflies flew backwards. I didn't know that their wings move independent of one another. So they can do all of these crazy acrobatics in the air. I didn't know that these scary looking gigantic flying things eat mosquitoes. Or are so tender with their young or fall asleep in the center of flowers. Or... Exactly. It's just the most amazing things you know there's there's ants in brazil that are like kamikaze ants they're the oldest ants in the colony <laughs> and if the colony gets attacked these older ants go out and they have like some sort of um explosive chemical <laughs> on them and they blow themselves up and blow up <laughs> the predator they're like suicide bomber ants there's um i mean it's just it's so fascinating all the stuff that i read and like you said worms if we didn't have worms i know they're connected with death and decay and all of that but if we didn't have them the soil would not be aerated they aerate the soil they also fertilize it i put so many worms in my raised garden boxes and i thought yes this is great and um they are great food for raccoons and possums who come in and just tear up your vegetable garden if you have the worms in there i was terrified of worms my whole life really i never held the cockroach as a kid space i let my staff do that but when I started leading these programs at the Arboretum, I just thought, this is ridiculous. I've got this entire program dedicating to helping children not be fearful of these creatures, but I'm too scared to touch them. And in my defense, like, I didn't have someone like me that was, you know, helping me move past that as a kid. But kind of similar to you, this one day I was like, this is, this is kind of ridiculous. You know that a worm can't hurt you. You know this is ridiculous. So I had a little can of red wigglers that I had bought for a composting activity we were going to do. And I just opened it up and I took a deep breath and I picked one of them up and I felt its insanely muscular body like, <laughs> move aggressively in my fingers. And it made me phenomenally uncomfortable. And then I just placed it on my hand and it writhed and wiggled and I hated every moment of it. And I'm still not excited when I touch them that I do it now, mm -hmm. you know, cockroaches, I don't struggle with anymore. I struggled with in the beginning. Um, but now I just pick them up like they're cats. Worms, I still have moments with them, but you also just like, I'm standing here with 24 children lined up eagerly with their hands out. Like, I want one, I want one, I want one. And I'm here at 44 years old, like, ugh, no. Right, you can't. Right? So you got to model so the there's an answer. That's what they've taught me. Right. To be much more to not be afraid courageous. to check my biases and to not be afraid of the things that I've been conditioned to be afraid of. I love that.
If you had one thing to tell the world, one thing that you could tell the world, what would it be? Some advice, a quote. Whatever your joy is, just seek it. You know, again, I, I don't mean to sound nihilistic, but it's a hard world. It's, it's, it's going to continue to be hard. So don't miss out on an opportunity to experience beauty and seek joy. And if you find it in somebody else, just spend your time appreciating that and them and it. Just seek joy. I like that. Yeah. We have to. What other choice do we really have? I think that another way of looking at that is, you know, live life to its fullest. Be aware, be mindful, be, be alive. It's where creativity comes from. You know, I mean, it just joy does so much. But you know, like we said, too, creativity comes from so many different places. And, and I will say that one of the times when I felt most alive was when I thought I was going to drown in the middle of the ocean in a kayak in a storm yeah. that hit us all of a sudden. So um, seek joy, be adventurous. <laughs> that means to you right like yeah. joy looks very different for me than it does for somebody else right adventure joyful adventure is very different for me than for somebody else like joyful adventure for me is hanging bridges in a rainforest but that would be miserable for somebody else whereas joyful adventure for somebody else could be skydiving or just like playing video games all day on a sunday i would i would hate that you know, but that's a joyful adventure for somebody for else. Somebody, yeah. So there's you not know a prescription for it. Sophie and I just, we had a little bit of time in between some activities at the museum this past weekend. So right outside of the California Science Center, which is right next door to the Natural History Museum as well, is a rose garden. Mm -hmm. And so we went out there, we found a shady patch of grass, and we just laid down on it Mm -hmm. and just watched the trees. We were underneath a cassia tree that was blooming with its beautiful golden flowers. And then we started noticing, oh, look, there's a date palm over here, and there's this other tree, and there's some agapanthus behind us. And, you know, started naming all the different flowers that were there, and then we started noticing Oh, there's like two little hummingbirds sitting up mm-hmm. there and you looked up we looked up yeah we laid down and looked up yeah I love that I always tell people on my tours don't forget to look up because mm-hmm. there's a lot to see I was so charmed and enchanted by this conversation as I always am when I talk to Brooke There is so much opportunity to learn new things and get curious about the world that you live in. And I hope that this episode inspires your travel bug, whether it's abroad or right in your own town. Take a walking tour. Every city can be an above ground archaeological dig. You've just got to do a little research to find the gems. This was actually a much longer talk than what you heard today. I mean, we really got deep into conversations about museums. So there is a part two, which I will publish next week that covers many more interesting museum topics like Victorian death culture and (laughs) duck races through stream to a soundtrack of the Ride of the Valkyries and so much more. As always, I'll post links in the show notes. There are going to be a lot of them today. Please continue to send me your questions and suggestions. I love hearing from you. And don't forget to take a moment to rate this episode. It only takes seconds, but your ratings really do help move this podcast closer to the top of searches so that my friends and I can reach more people. I am looking forward to sharing more upcoming In the Company of Friends talks with you. So be sure to follow me on the socials and the dot com all at the Queen Trail podcast. That is T-H-E-Q-U-A-I-N-T-R-E-L-L-E podcast. I am Syl Annan, the Queen Trail. And until next time, I wish you passion, grace, adventure, curiosity, positive connections, opportunities to indulge your inner child, elegance, and beauty.